today. Bless the Lord. Well, I'm hoping I am. I'm hoping you are. Uh, we want to continue uh, something that I started uh, two weeks ago when I talked about God is good. Oral Roberts said that. God is good. And he was persecuted for the next 50 plus years. Not because of the finance or the Oral Roberts University, but really because he made that statement. It became a national news media frenzy over that statement. Definitely feeling uh, the news media and the world basically could not accept that word. And in fact, most of the church couldn't accept that word. We, we tried. We, we wanted to. I believe that we wanted to. But there's, yeah, but what about yeah, but what about this? Yeah, but what about this scripture? Yeah, but what about this situation? What? And so all of these kinds of questions begin to surface. And as God is giving revelation to his body, his church, on grace, Jesus is full of grace and truth. And the more we receive grace and truth, the healthier the church will become. The healthier your families will become the more likely you are to achieve the promises of God because they come by faith through grace, grace through faith. It, it, they work hand in hand, and it'll, the promises just struggled getting to you whenever you attach anything to it that I can or I did. or I. And so it, when we start putting it into ourselves, we find out that we're not capable of bringing it. We put ourselves under law. But when we realize that Jesus did, that's when we start to enter the mentality that of grace and truth. It's grace and truth finished it, did it completely on our behalf. And we can't add to it, but religion has taught us that we have to add to it. There has to be something that we're doing. And the Bible is very clear that what are the works of God when they asked Jesus that question, he said... The works are, as Pastor Jason was talking up here about the offering, believe in him whom he sent. In other words, believe what's written in the book. And then when you start grasping believe what's written in the book, people take that to a different degree, and they begin to believe a lot of the negative because they have a wrong image of God, a wrong image of a father. You can get a wrong image of a father simply from your father. So they begin to drag your father's relationship with you into your relationship with Father God. And now you've got more problems. And you think that's how a father is. But this father is a good father. I like the song that we do. Uh, it's just been singing it the last few months. You're a good, good father. That's who you are. That's who I am. That's, that's so powerful because I think... We're finally getting it programmed more and more into our hearts. So this uh, little girl woke up one morning, and she looked in the mirror, and she had only three hairs on her head. And so she didn't know what to do with her hair. Finally, she decided to braid it. That worked out good. She had a great day. The next morning, she woke up, and she only had two hairs left, and she didn't know what to do with her hair. So she decided, I'll part it. And she had a great day. And the third day, she woke up, and she had only one hair. And she didn't know what to do with her hair, so she decided to wear it in a ponytail. And on the fourth day, she woke up and realized that she had no hair. And she said, thank God, I don't have to fix my hair. Now, that is a positive energy joke. But it is connected to what I believe is the kind of attitude that we need to develop. And as long as we have a negative attitude or any part of a negative attitude towards the God of this universe that holds the universe together, we are going to operate more and more in the negative rather than in the positive. And the more we operate in the positive, the more we operate in the energy and the power of the light or Christ Jesus or the Word. So it only makes sense that we would try to do all that we can to make sure that our thoughts are positive, 
Think on these things that are good, pure, excellent, and praiseworthy. Begin to do exactly what, what comes out of our mouth should be positive and encouraging to others, even to yourself. Amen. And then there ought to be something that we do concerning action, that there ought to be something that we do concerning serving or benefiting someone else with our life. So our actions. Now, so if we get our thoughts and our words and our actions lined up with good, then surely goodness and mercy will catch you. I don't think you got that, but that's a pretty simple sermon. We could actually sit down and quit right now. Because you can take that home and start working on it. That's really an important part of the aspects of really living in the goodness and the promises of our God. I think that it's interesting that the Bible says we should praise the Lord continually. Well, if you have anything in you that believes God has done something bad to you, it is really difficult to praise him for that. Amen. Amen. And so we have all kinds of different attitudes that have been developed by this religious notion that goes on and has gone on in our lives. So I'm going to take it at 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. They'll put that out. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light or God is energy or God is power, and in him there is no what? Darkness. Now, that's wonderful, but do you notice the words that are following it? At all. In fact, if you look this up, you find that it's emphatic. John is trying to make a serious, serious point. He's trying to say that apparently there had to have been people that were already thinking God was involved in the darkness or the evil that was around and surrounding them at this time. And Paul, uh, Paul, or, uh, John says right here, there is no darkness in him at all. At all means that he can't have anything to do with darkness. In fact, if you really analyze darkness, you can't see darkness because it is the absence of the presence of God. It is the absence of his light, absence of his energy, absence. It is actually, if you analyze it, all the way down, it is just absent. Amen. Amen. If you go to Genesis chapter 1 and look at this, and remember, we're just kind of reasoning together over this series dealing with God is good. And so there's a lot of perceptions that have to be changed in our hearts. And you have to allow the Spirit of God to be, begin to bring light into these areas in your life. We were talking a little bit on the way to church today that God just... Darkness is not to have a part of our life because darkness is only enter energized by us if we believe in something that is negative. If you believe the doctor's report, then you've bought in and you have empowered the sickness. That's why he tells you not to empower the sickness. You are not, I am sick. No, 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 I am healed. Now that's That's... It's a reverse, and it's saying God has already taken care of this from the foundation of time, and I'm not going to empower darkness in my life. And this is really related directly to the energy and the power of this message of grace and what God desires. So in Genesis chapter 1, look at verse 1 first. Let's see if you can go back to verse 1. You're on verse 2. Can you go back to verse 1? Well, any, I can all, we can all quote it because you all know it real well. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth and hell. He didn't? Well, it's not in there. Oh, well, that, that's interesting. He created heaven and earth. First, the invisible to make what is visible out of. Because everything was made in Hebrews, it says everything that is visible is made out of what was not visible. So he created the invisible, a place for his being and his bride to live eternal. Then he provided a place on earth for us to live in an earth suit. 
in the preparation for us to be prepared to be his bride. Amen. That's what we're in is the preparation for. We're supposed to grow in love, grow together. I said grow together. Amen. And so he, but he didn't create hell. What's your perception of hell? Did God create hell? It's a place that God created to send everybody that doesn't receive the light? So I'm just messing with your religion now. I'm messing with your belief system. But it's an important, very, very, very important place because then you're saying God is part of darkness. Because hell is darkness. It is the absence of God's power and light. So who creates hell? You do. We are the ones that create our own hell here on earth. Oh, don't we love it? Or we create our own hell for an eternity if we don't receive Christ and the light and the power and the energy of life for eternal life with Father God, we will live eternal life in darkness. It's not going to be a party there. It is the absence of the presence of God. So if it's the absence of presence of God, then he couldn't have created it. Can somebody reason just a little bit? I know I'm messing with you guys, but I'm having a really good time. And uh, these are things that I would have liked to taught 20 years ago. But anyway, in the beginning, but see, when you reach 80, you just don't care. I'm only 70. Okay. <laughs> was, was that prophetic? I'm not sure. Okay, in the beginning, <laughs> God created... The heavens and the earth, go to the second one. And the earth was without form and void. And what? Darkness was. And it is very important for you to get this straight, that he didn't create darkness. Darkness simply was or is the absence of everything that isn't. It's nothingness. No energy, no light. No God. That is what hell is. Now, I know there are all kinds of scriptures that try to verify or bring up about the fire and the flames. That's all there to generate a mentality in us that that's not a place we want to go. That we would be driven towards the light. And that we would choose the light. For God said, I give you... Life or death, but here you go. Why don't you choose life? Why don't you choose light? Why don't you choose the energy and the goodness of our God? Because that will give you this abundant life that we talk about. But it's been put into us to make the decision by an act of our own free will. Is anybody home? So darkness exists, it doesn't exist, it is the absence of what does exist. And I could take you into why that's important, but that's not right now. We'll get to that maybe in the future. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, he was made, we are made in his likeness and image, spirit, particularly now born again. We are born again spirit, so we are in the image and likeness of God. And our soul is being changed, and our body is in decay. And the body is going back to dust. But the Bible and the Word of God is to be changing the parts of our soul that are what controls our actions. 
Your soul, your mind, will, and your emotion is what's running your heart right now. It's what's communicating with every cell in your body. It's constantly finding out from every cell, what do you need? Well, I need some potassium. I need some. And it begins to communicate what, so then suddenly you are hungry for chocolate. No, that's not necessarily true. And, but you, you're, that's probably the devil. So, but it's. So, so it begins to say, this is the nutrition you need. And so we, 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 so it's, it's the soul that is in the process of being changed. It is the soul that goes through the scripture that says the word of God is for correcting, training, and teaching in the ways of right living or right righteousness. And so it's the soul that the word of God is working on. Again, comes down to why is it important to be in church so you can hear the word how does faith come by hearing and hearing? What is faith? Faith is light. Faith is life. This is where you get charged up with life and light so that you can live more in the positive than you do in the negative. And we only have to take, only takes one day a week to be able to last all week. Look what the world can do to you in six days. Can you imagine what God can do for you just in one that doesn't sound, but that's how he works. It's powerful, and he can fill you up and charge you with every bit of light that will push back all of the darkness the rest of the week. I think some people got that, but amen. So let's go to verse 18. And the Lord God said, oh, what did he say? It is not... Good. Now, when he created, this is very important for you to grasp, and you've heard it many times before, but think about this. When he created creation for man to live in, every single day he said, and it is good. He did not say it is good and bad. He just said everything I've done is good. In other words, everything God does is good. And he created man, but when he created male and female in the pile of dirt, the soul breathed the breath of life into them, and they became a living soul. He did not say it is good. It's the only time he didn't say it was good. Why? Why didn't he say it was good? Because he gave you and I a free will to decide between good and bad. We're the only part of all of creation that has the ability to make this decision. And you say, why did he give you that ability to make that decision? Why did he give us dominion and authority on this earth? The reason is, is he did not want to create a bride that was a robot that was created to be perfect for him. He wanted to create a bride that would choose him. Everything in my life and my heart worked diligently that this woman would want to be my bride, would love. Come on. And you, you, so you understand it. For, so that's why God gave us an absolute free will to decide. And that decision is between good and and darkness. And when they, Adam and Eve chose darkness, some things happened. The enemy came and basically said to Eve and, and to Adam, both, they were both there. He basically said, I want to tell you that this nothingness is actually somethingness. That's actually what he said. I want, to, I want you to understand that you don't know the stuff that God knows. Wait a minute. God only knows good. But his lie is God knows evil. They were placed in grace and perfection. And he made nothingness sound like somethingness. Listen, it, it goes on. You have to hear Jason's sermon today or get the CD from last night, see, because when you, when you grasp it and, and, and listen to it, you're going to find out about the goodness 
of our God and that the goodness of our God is all about partying. And see, the lie of the enemy is that Miller High Life and the party is shoot up a little drugs and some date drugs and some sex and some stuff. Old country song I was telling Jason about today was it's an old country song. that said I went out to the bar and I picked up an eight, but I woke up with a one. See, Yeah, you laughing because you know you heard that song. Yeah, you did, and you was probably in a bar when you heard it. <laughs> so we begin to grasp that this is what the enemy still does today is try to get you to convince that that nothingness is actually somethingness. Instead of partying with God, he wants you to party with him. And partying with God is the house where we come and praise and we build, built up in joy and built up in the goodness of our God and how God wants us to have the best, best possible life. And the lie of the enemy is to constantly say, that's not fun. And it actually is the identification of fun. You, instead of getting drunk on wine that leads to debauchery, you get drunk on the Holy Ghost. You ever been, how many have been drunk on the Holy Ghost? I mean, I, sometimes on Wednesday night, I, we, we're praying for people, and I barely can stand, and I lose my ability. To, I can't even think at all. It's just, whoo! That's where joy lives. That's where fun lives. That's where the goodness of God lives. Is anybody home today? This is where it's at. Will you just grasp this, and it's a message that Dr. Moraine's been teaching on Wednesday night, too. Our God's a party God. Welcome to the party. Let's all get high on God. Make sure I finish that statement, right? Amen. So we begin to look at this. So then we, we start wondering about, a little bit about the negative and and where this all comes from, in Job chapter 3, verse 25, let's go there quickly. In Job chapter 3, in verse 25, for the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. And we have to understand in Job's situation here, of course, it's a long story, and we understand most of you have heard most of it, but let me just pull this part that I think is important. Job's thoughts, Job's words, and the sacrifices, the actions, began to produce exactly what he was believing for. Because fear is nothing more than negative faith. And it begins to direct the energy that God sends so we can use it for dominion and authority. We begin to use that power that's been sent to us and we empower through fear the bad things that happen in our lives. God sent it for us to use it so that it would empower the good things in our life. But because we have this thing called free will, we get to decide what to do with it when it comes. This helps you understand why it's important to say, by his stripes I'm healed. He became poor that I might be made rich. That he sent his peace that passes understanding, that he's given me favor with God and with man. So we begin to, this, now we're lining up with the energy and the power that holds the universe together. We're lining up with what God's plan is for our life instead of directing it towards some negative thing in our lives. Everybody kind of get that? Okay, so this old cowboy he bought a horse from the circuit riding preacher. You've heard this joke before, but listen, I want you to get it anyway, and I really don't care. But it's a, it's a good story. It ties in. And so the circuit riding preacher said, hey, 100 bucks, the horse is yours, but there are some peculiarities about the horse, and he got the cowboy to get real close, and he whispered to him. He said, now, the, the horse only stops on amen. Or the horse, yeah, he only runs on praise the Lord. 
And so the preacher said, the cowboy said, you know, don't tell me how to ride a horse. I grew up on horses. I understand horses, and I can handle a horse just fine, so don't, just leave me alone about this. So he got on the horse, and the preacher said, well, praise the Lord, horse took off. Whew. Took out across the, de- I mean, just, just galloping and galloping, and it was headed for a thousand-foot cliff. And the old cowboy just, he started to pray. He did everything he could. He didn't know what, uh, what to do. He just said, and he prayed, and as he finished praying, he said, amen, and the horse stopped right on the edge of the cliff. The cowboy took his hat off and said, praise the Lord. <laughs> so now when you, when you look at that and you think about it, what his thoughts, his words, and his actions took him over the cliff. And this is where we're missing it in the body of Christ. This is where it's so critical and important for us to grasp Titus chapter 2 and verse 13, when it says 11 through 13, it says that the, well, I think they can put that up. I might have skipped a little bit. Can you put that up for me? Titus only got a few minutes left. Titus 2, 11 through 14. I probably moved a little ahead of them. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that we might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his special people, zealous for, zealous for, zealous for doing good. Now, why does this scripture exist concerning grace? And this is where the message gets all fouled up because we think that now we're under grace, we can just do what we want. No, we have to understand that we still have dominion and authority and power in our will. And that if we desire and choose to do darkness, darkness will punish you. In other words, sin punishes sin, God does not. In Genesis chapter 3, when we look at the curses, it has been misread for thousands of years because we think God cursed the devil. We think that God cursed man. We think that God cursed woman. And that is not how it even reads He said, your actions and what you have done. Come on, if you read it close, that's exactly your actions. What you thought, what you planned, what you said has now, and your action has now produced where you're going to live and the experience you're going to have. Did anybody get that? And this is what the body has to understand. That's why this scripture exists. Because God is saying to us, listen, grace has paid a complete price for you to live a good life. But you're going to have to watch your thinking, you're going to have to watch your speaking, and you're going to have to watch your doing. Because you're still going to experience your sin will punish your sin. I'm not doing it. I ain't causing it. I didn't do it. God did not do it. You did. Sin punishes sin. Now, you want to hear a wild and crazy message? Come next week. Tune in. It's the same time, same station. And I'm telling you, same thing for you that are streaming out there and watching today. Tune in next week. So we're going to talk about the flood. And this is going to... Definitely mess with your religion. But it is time for truth. Because my God is a good God. He doesn't kill. It's the devil that kills, steals, and destroys. And we're going to get this straight in the body of Christ finally. If you got anything out of that, give the Lord a hand clap. I'm going to quit. 
Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. We give you glory. Let truth be settled in every heart, Lord. Those things that are not true to be washed away in the precious blood of Christ, and we'll give you praise and we'll give you glory for it. There's someone out there that's never received Christ Jesus, those that might be watching on the stream and anyone else in the auditorium today. Pray this prayer with me. Just take a chance. See what happens. It's absolutely an amazing thing. I did this when I was 27 years old, and it revolutionized and changed my life. I didn't expect it to change my life, but it did. So I just challenge you to pray this prayer. Everyone just repeat after me. Dear Father God, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. And I ask you, dear Jesus, come into my life, come into my heart, be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Appreciate you tuning in. I know that the Word of God's having a tremendous effect in your life as well. Please continue to listen to this series because I believe it has to be changed in every heart of every Christian. It's got to understand that our God is a good God. Have a good week. God bless you.